next we will have Martin Split. And first time since I started this trend now. So, so I met Martin, actually I saw Martin the first talk live in uh, NG Vikings in Finland last year. And uh, I was so impressed because uh, uh, actually one of the speakers uh, couldn't make it. It was um, very bad uh, weather conditions, I think, mm -hmm. in Germany at that time. So the, the connector flight couldn't get in. And organized like, hey, who, who can sort of do a random talk in like one hour right away without any preparation? And uh, Martin's like, yeah, I can do it. I personally enjoyed it. It was, it was one of my uh, highlights of that. Uh, <laughs> of the conference is really beautiful talk. Thank so you. Um, Martin was uh, here in Toronto. Was here in Toronto. Uh, he had a conference, conference. at mm. uh, Web Unleashed. Web Unleashed. Uh, I think on Saturday and Friday. Yeah. Friday and Saturday. That's the way around. So uh, we're lucky to get in here. So I decided, okay, I can do my talk next time, <laughs> and this time I'll listen to Martin. It's All right. Very, thank you. Very nice of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, I think, when, when did we work that one out, Alex? That was like yesterday or something, right? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. So Overnight, I, I think I was texting you like 12 at night and then 5 in the morning as well. Time zones are hard. It's hours away. <laughs> so like, um, yeah, so I had more, I had like basically infinitely more preparation than I had in uh, NG Vikings, but yet, you know, it's just been a day. But so great to be here, so great to see you all here at the Angular Meetup, and I think it's like one of the first that is being organized here in this uh, office, so I hope you enjoy the office and the pizzas as well. Uh, thanks, for Navo, uh, thanks to Navo for sponsoring as well. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So I am not from the Angular team, I am from a team that is called the Web Content Ecosystem Team. Who here knows what that is? <laughs> so, I'm basically working with uh, Google Search mostly, and my job is to make sure that you can succeed on the web. If you make websites or web applications, then I want you to make sure um, that you can actually be found via search engines. Not just Google Search, basically every search engine, but obviously Google Search is the search engine that I have the most influence over, because if I tell like Microsoft or the other companies how to do their things, they're just gonna laugh at me and just like go away. Um, which is what mostly happens with Google search as well, I guess. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so basically my job is to make sure that you are seeing a successful path on the web and that people who are searching for the services that you offer or the websites that you build, that they are finding it. Um, and I do that through a bunch of things. It's internal advocacy as well as external advocacy. And that's why I'm here tonight. I want to take the mysterious uh, mystery of SEO away a little bit and dis just clarify a few things and give you a few tools to test and, and check your websites as well as uh, techniques to like overcome challenges that you might face. So who here knows what SEO is? Who here really knows what SEO is? <laughs> that's, what, that's fantastic, like a few people are like me, uh, let's see. So basically what I'll do tonight is I'll walk you through more or less three major steps. First things first, we're gonna clarify what SEO is according to my definition. Now my definition is not the necessarily the one right definition. SEO is quite broad as it turns out. It's like, what is development, right? Someone says like, oh, you know, development is doing all the requirements analysis. The next person's like, development is about, about testing and automatic testing and test-driven development. The next person's like, well, it's this, this embedded devices, the next person is games, development is a large field and so is SEO. But we'll look into like a useful working definition of SEO for our day-to-day -day work. Uh, then we're gonna look into the technical details of how search engines work. Again, this is roughly the same for all search engines, however, our search engine is the one that I know best, so a few things might be specific to our search engine. And then, this is an Angular meetup, so finally we're gonna talk about technical SEO specifically for Angular which is what's probably most interesting, but trust me, the other ones are good as well. And because I only have so much time, I'll then also talk a little bit about testing tools, and last but not least, I'll give you a bunch of pointers if you need more information or if you need to point SEOs that you work with or fellow developers that you work with to documentation that backs up on what the pictures and things that you say and, and uh, took and, and bring back home. Cool, so what the hell is SEO? And um, I've seen 
many people struggle to find good definitions and like some people, when I ask that question to developer audiences, sometimes they say very rude things about SEOs. And as a web developer myself, I understand why. Um, but honestly, good SEOs are really, really like worth the weight in gold. Um, but you know, it's like stars, few and far in between. So my definition of SEO is, SEO should look at providing users with useful and good content, original content. Now that's not really something that we have control over, right? It's like something that uh, the business side of things usually discusses. Marketing, sales, uh, C-levels discuss what's going on the website. And then strategy is a thing that SEOs are concerned with. Again, that's more like marketing and business level executors. So like what are, what, what are we talking about this SEO? If that's SEO, then I as a developer have not much to contribute, right? But that's wrong because there's also the technical axis. And this is where we are at home. Right? This is our stuff and uh, usually SEOs are experts in a few of these things, not necessarily in all of them, a very few are actually really good at all, of, uh, all three of these, but basically they're not focusing on web development and we all know that basically a new framework is coming out. As I speak, probably five new have made it to Hacker News. Um, <laughs> so they're not really keeping up at the pace that we are keeping up and that's okay because you're not keeping up with all the SEO changes that are happening and that's okay too. But if we all talk to each other and work together, then that's not a problem. That's actually a fantastically well done job in splitting up responsibilities. So we will focus mostly on technology side of things for now, like SEO, technical SEO is what we are doing. As developers, we have the biggest impact there. But let me say a thing before we do that, which is if you're entirely focusing yourself on technical SEO and ignoring the fact that content and strategy are also part of the mix, you will have a bad time. Your SEO will be chocolate ice cream. <laughs> um, and I'd like to give you an example. So I'm German originally. I live in Switzerland, but I was born and raised in Germany. So breakfast is a really important meal to me, right? And uh, I have a toaster that was passed down to me from my parents. And it moved in with me when I had my first own apartment. And it was there when I met the love of my life it was there when I got married and uh, has recently, well, moved to the state up far, uh, the, the, the farm upstate, I guess. It's like, it's, it broke down. So I need a new toaster, great. So I'm going into the internet because I'm, you know, a developer, so I'm like, I'm go just gonna Google it, really, I don't know. I go to Google, I find this website for toasters, and I'm like, huh, is this a good website for that purpose? I don't know. So looking. Looking at the image real quick, it looks like a toaster. This might be the opening, this might be the knob to like dial in how dark I want my toast. But I'm not sure if this really is a toaster because this might be something else. So I look at the most prominent element after the image, which is the uh, headline that says, smart, simple, and beautiful. This could be a watch, this could be a phone, this could be a car, this is not helpful, thank you very much, good job. And then it says it will disrupt your breakfast. Now this might be great in the Silicon Valley, but I want a peaceful breakfast. This is a very important meal for me. It's like a culturally inappropriate to disrupt my breakfast. So like, I have a bad feeling about this website at this point. And then it's like thermochemical food processing. The fuck does that mean? I don't know. Moving on. The best invention since sliced bread. Great. So this website doesn't really help me to make a decision if I want this website to be the website where I pick my next toaster. What else do they have in store? Well. They have our philosophy. <laughs> okay, great. I had Latin in school. I read a bunch of great philosophers. I don't think hot bread is one of them. <laughs> and then they have the hot bread X10. I don't even know what the hot bread is. Why would I buy the hot or click on the hot bread X10? And then I can join the movement. Thank you very much. I'm very happy with my religion. Moving swiftly on. So you see like this might be using the latest, greatest Angular version. It might be doing like server-side rendering. It might be super fast. It might have all the bells and whistles. But this website is chocolate ice cream as far as picking a new toaster goes. <coughs> same website, same design even. Just different words make a world's difference here, right? This website, the fastest toaster. There we go, now we're talking. I'm German, I want efficiency even at the breakfast, so this is a fast toaster, I like this. Never burns my toast again, that gives me safety. Amazing, I love that. Get your toast faster, yeah, we got over that. Try toast, you make toaster face. Okay, cool. But I'm an engineer, 
So I overanalyze everything. So I'm like, is this the right toaster for me? It's a fast toaster and it doesn't burn my toast, that's great. But I actually don't know the requirements of a good toaster, like what criteria do I need to apply for my toaster research? I have no idea. I've not bought a toaster, it has so far been passed on to me, right? <laughs> So how do I know if I buy a good toaster? I want the right toaster and I don't know, you know like how hard it is to find the right tool for the thing that you're trying to build. So like I'm like, oh, okay, spreadsheet, here we go, right? <laughs> but what, and then I'm stuck, then I'm stuck with my spreadsheet because what do I put in my spreadsheet? I don't know the criteria to look for, but conveniently these people have me covered, they know me, they tell me how to choose a toaster. Ah, fantastic. Now I work out that this toaster isn't for me, I actually need a different model, that's not a problem, they have all their models under our toasters, and once I find the model that is appealing to me and the right one for me, I can just click on buy a toaster, done. Fantastic. You see, the technology, even the design, do not really matter for this one, it's the content, it's the words on the page that you put, the images on the page that you put, they make a world's difference if you choose them right. And trust me, that's hard. And SEOs do not necessarily have to be experts on that themselves. They are not copywriters. Copywriters are copywriters, as the name suggests. So definitely consider hiring copywriters if you're not sure. And if you're building websites like this, just don't. Right, cool. Now, to understand how we can do the technical side of SEO, though, uh, we need to understand how do websites end up in search engines. And I'll walk you through that process by looking at what Google search does. In this case, our little friend, the Google bot. So how does that work? Well, we have a list of URLs that we know to exist. And we take one of these URLs and basically put it into a crawler. The crawler is a small little program. It's basically curl with bells and whistles that uh, curl does not really have. What it does is it makes an HTTP request. Ta-da! Very complicated, right? So it makes an HTTP request, gets some HTML. This HTML is then processed. We are parsing the HTML, not using regex. Oh my God, do not ever parse HTML in regex. Um, we are basically parsing the HTML for links. So we look for link tags with, H uh, with, with URLs as their href because we can feed them back to the URL crew, uh, crawl queue and basically start crawling the next page. This is how we move from page to page and basically index the, uh, and crawl the entire web. Okay, cool, that's, that's great, that's all nice and fine. Um, next up, we can look at the content. It's like, okay, so what is this website about? Toasters, oh, okay, this is the fastest toaster, good. Uh, it's the best toaster, good. It never burns your toast, fantastic. Um, and we can basically put that in our index. Now if I come and search for toasters, oops, I'm sorry, I basically can start to like look at what we have in the index by basically we are ranking it and we are showing what we think is the best answer or the bunch of best answers to the user looking for a new toaster. Great, that works for pretty much everything else as well. Um, so if my website is about dogs, then we're gonna figure out, okay, so looking at the HTML, this is about dogs, great. So we're gonna put it under dogs. If you search for cute dogs, you find that website. Fantastic. Except your website might, or web app for that matter, might look like this. Familiar with that? Right, so what is this website about? So this comes from the crawler and now we need to figure out what are the links in this one and what is this website about? I mean, come on, didn't you listen? I just told you it's a website about toasters, obviously. So, yeah, this is, a website is obviously about toasters. So that's, that's tricky. So does that mean that SEO for single page applications that are client side rendered do not, does not work, it doesn't exist? Does it, like, oh my God, we have to do something else now. Uh, no, that's not quite true. It's like, it looks like tricky at the first moment. It's like, oh, the crawler comes back with this HTML and the HTML is empty, but we actually do something, oops, ah, what happened here? Aha, okay, sorry, different version of the slides than I thought. Um, never make last minute adjustments to slides that you have. Um, and actually the thing is like some crawlers don't actually run JavaScript. Like if you have used Slack or Twitter or Facebook, you know that they don't actually run JavaScript. If you use like these open graph tags to describe uh, the content with some, some description and maybe an image or something, and you have that behind JavaScript and you're using client-side rendering, they are not rendering it. But that doesn't mean that Googlebot doesn't render it. Actually, many search engines are considering or even doing it already and running JavaScript. And Googlebot is one of them. Googlebot does run JavaScript, so you don't have to worry about that. For us, your Angular client-side rendering application is not a problem per se. 
However, it turns out the web has a few pages, uh, a few many. And um, as it turns out on, on top of that, computing resources aren't infinite. Yeah, but you can use the cloud. Breaking news, the cloud is just a bunch of computers. It's just not just, yeah, it's still computers that need to do this. So in uh, 2016, we have basically been visiting 130 trillion URLs. And as you can probably guess, we can't just all crawl and render them in one go, so we have to invent a different mechanism for this. So what we are doing is basically, as part of the processing step, we also queue your page for rendering, for proper rendering where JavaScript is executed. And then as rendering resources become available, and this is usually faster than people think. Like some SEOs tell you like, oh, it's gonna take months. That's not true. In very few cases, exceptional cases, it might take up to a week, but it's very unlikely that that's gonna hit you specifically. And once we have the rendering resources available, which might happen after seconds, after minutes, maybe hours, um, we will actually render them. And we're gonna use Chrome for that. Basically, it's a headless Chrome. It's more or less like Puppeteer if you want to uh, think of it that way. Basically, we run like a headless browser on our server infrastructure, and that one then takes the HTML that we fetched earlier on, fetches all the other resources, the JavaScript, the images, whatnot, and basically renders it into a proper page and passes the HTML that was generated from that back into the processing step. If now we have more links, we're gonna pass them again, put them back in the render queue and uh, in the crawl queue, and also we're gonna push the content forward. Now that the JavaScript has executed, we have the full content, hopefully, um, and we pass that onwards to indexing stage as well. Perfect, fantastic. You might hear some SEOs saying that the Chrome version, actually some developers believe that as well still. Uh, some might say that the Chrome version that is being used is really, really old, it's Chrome 41, oh my God. That's not true either. In uh, Google I.O., at Google I.O. in May, in May uh, this year, we introduced or, or announced that we are finally running an evergreen Chrome in Googlebot. So whenever there's a new stable release of Chrome, we are actually updating within a couple of weeks and then we are crawling with the latest version of Chromium. So that means that if your browser supports it, and it's Chrome, that your browser is, no, well, that was a weird sentence. If you're using Chrome for testing or surfing the web, then that means that that's pretty much what Googlebot sees as well, with a few exceptions. Uh, once we have done all that, there's also ranking. I'm not gonna talk about ranking today. So everything that we're gonna discuss are the things that you can actually influence as a developer. And the things you can influence are the crawl process, the way that we process your website, the way that we render your website, and the way that we index your website. Those are the things that you have control over. Ranking is basically just us going through the index, all the pages that we have for the index, and figuring out using hundreds of factors which one might be the best res response or the best search result for the user searching for something. So it, it, let's ignore ranking. Right, so what can you do to help us work with your website? First things first, make sure that you're linking your different pages properly with each other. Also, if I say linking, I mean actual linking. Do not use buttons or spans or divs with on-click handlers. Use actual links to do that, please. Thank you very much, right? Googlebot does not click on stuff. And the rule of thumb is, if it does something on the page that you are on, then it's probably a button. If it takes you to different content, and it's probably a link. That's like a very good rule of thumb to follow. Um, if you do that, then you are probably uh, very safe already. Also, by God, do not use hash URLs. They are a hack, right? So these fragments, these hashes, in this case, um, hash products, um, even if there's like an exclamation mark, that's just lying to yourself, right? These are basically fragments, which means they are a part of the existing content. I have a very long document. I have like a Wikipedia page on Jam. And then somewhere, it's like Jam was invented by Mr. and Mrs. Jam, I don't know. Um, and then somewhere is like history, and then you can click on that, and then it scrolls down to that page, uh, to that part of the page that covers the history of Jam. Great, but that's what it's used for. This, ha this uh, hash, this fragment, is part of a navigation within the document. We don't care about it, we ignore it, because we only care about the entire content for each URL. So in this case, if you're using that to, to load different content, then we are completely like not seeing it. We only see slash and we're like, okay, so there's a link to the homepage and there's another link to the homepage. Oh, okay. 
don't use it. Seriously, don't. And unfortunately, I would love to say like, oh yeah, it's default. I mean, it's default in, in Angular Router, fantastic. But a lot of people are still using hash URLs and I have just seen uh, the latest data is just very saddening. Um, also, not all of your pages have to be in Google, in Google search or in search engines in total. If you have pages that are really thin on content or just have very, very bad content, for whatever reason, then you don't have to necessarily push them into, into search engines, right? So let's say like you have a page on um, shipping information for a country where you don't ship. Then this could be either part of another page or just like not have it. And then if people are like looking for it, they might not find it, but that's okay because you're not shipping there anyways, right? So like make sure that you are only focusing on the things that you truly care about when it comes to search engine optimization. You optionally can also give us an XML file that tells us what pages you've got. Don't mess around with like priority. People have tried to like basically, use, so wait, it's an XML file. It gives you like different locations and you put in the URL and then you have a few other fields that you can hypothetically put like priority. Guess what happened? Everyone put all their pages for priority one and we're like, thanks. So this isn't really useful, so we're ignoring it these days. But basically, a sitemap still helps us the page, for the pages that are not linked as well or as much to find them and probably crawl and index them. But you don't have to use a sitemap. Okay, now that's very generic, that's very high level. Uh, I am happily elaborating on that if you want me to after, after the talk. But now we wanna talk about SEO for Angular. All right, let's do this. So, first things first, titles and meta descriptions matter. Let's say I'm looking for a recipe for cupcakes. And I want cupcakes specifically that are easy to make because I'm a lazy baker. I love Great British Bake Off. I would never do anything similar. Um, if your titles look like this, so they are all the same, and the meta descriptions are all the same, as a user, I'm not quite sure which one to click on. So I might just click on another page that has a better, more useful title than Barbara's Baking Blog. Nah, don't care. What you can do though, to help me a little bit, is to give me useful information in the titles and meta descriptions that is specific to the URL that I'm looking at, right? If this says apple pie, I'm like, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, birthday cupcakes, yes, right on. That's the result that I needed. The awesome brownies are probably nice if, they, if awesome means uh, hash browns, as in like, I mean, this is Toronto, right? <laughs> um, and this would be probably very nice, but you know, anyway, moving on. Make sure that you have a meta description and a title that matches the page content, not just like have the same title and meta description for all your pages. You're losing out on a bunch of visibility here. To do that, you can use the title and meta services. They are built in into Angular. Who's using them on their website today? That's why you are here, great. <laughs> Every one of you should use them. You just import them, uh, the title and meta services, and then Whenever you have your proper, uh, properties loaded, whenever you have your content ready, in this case, I just use the ng on in it, but it doesn't have to be here. And you can also update your title as you go along. It's fine as well, right? You basically say like the title is this and the description is this. And then you can have content that is more helpful to the user searching for the content that you have on that page. It's a very, very easy, a very low hanging fruit. That's a very easy thing to improve your search engine optimization already or to optimize your presence in search engines. And this is not just Google, this is other, like Bing and stuff also use this, DuckDuckGo probably as well. There's one more thing. Um, you can also tell us to not index something. So I said like if you have thin content, as in like a page that doesn't have as much content, as much useful content, or if you have content where you're like, oh, this is crap, uh, which is probably a bunch of, con on, uh, of content, if it looks like the first page I showed you for the toasters, then just like put it everywhere. But you can use the meta service to also include a meta tag called robots. Robots can take different values and one of the values is no index. No index means do not put this in the index. You can crawl it, but do not put it in the index. Please do not let this show up in search results and we will not show them in search results. This is particularly handy also for soft errors, which we're gonna talk about later. Sometimes you have multiple URLs pointing to the same content and that is fine, but you want us to probably focus your content, tra sorry, your traffic from search engines on one specific URL and you want us to crawl one specific URL. Okay, so let's see. So let's say I have a recipe for cupcakes, cool. Um, but I also support people who are typing uppercase. That's okay, that's fine, I'm case insensitive, all is good. 
Um, both of these URLs route and don't, I'm not using like redirects or something, I'm just like handling them in the router properly. Uh, maybe you have IDs for your recipes. In this case, the cupcakes recipe is under uh, the fantastic ID here. And maybe you have like some legacy URLs that you somehow have to support because you had an old CMS beforehand and now you have the new shiny Angular application in place that does it much nicer with nicer URLs. None of these URLs gives you benefits in terms of SEO. All of these are equally good because we don't care, right? So like recipe ID 1337 is as good as recipes uh, cupcake or something like that. But what we don't want is we don't want them all to be as in like, so we want to tell Google which one is the one that we want them to put in the index because if they basically take the, if we are taking the effort to like get all four of these URLs and we find like, oh, they're all duplication, like they're all the same page, we're going to throw three of them away. But we only basically give you so many HTTP requests per day. So you're wasting three HTTP requests here and you're also, What's even worse, if you're looking at the search traffic that is coming to you, you have a really hard time figuring out which pages are popular because you're spreading your traffic across four pages in the worst case, right? Or four URLs, like the same one page, four URLs. That's what I mean, sorry. The way to deal with that is to build something like the link service. I hope that eventually this will make it into uh, Angular. I should probably make like a pull request or something. Now that I think about it, anyway. <laughs> Um, Hamlet Batista came up with this, so I'm using his, his implementation here. Uh, basically, you're looking at the DOM and what you're doing is you inject a new element, a link element with the relation uh, canonical, or in this case, like this is a generic component, like it can take style sheets or whatever, I don't care. Um, and then it has some href that it points to, fantastic. What do we use it for in terms of SEO? We use it for canonicalization. Canonicalization is the process of telling us at Google, this is the URL that I think is the right URL for this content. This is the URL that I truly care for. In this case, for instance, I want uh, the recipe slash cupcake and I only use lowercase things. That's okay, that's fine. Um, then I can use the link service that I just created. I import that into my component and then I say create me a canonical link. So the relation link, relation equals canonical and then the href goes to the URL that is my base URL slash recipe slash the name of the recipe. In this case, if we come to this page from recipe slash 1337, then we'll be like, okay, so here's the HTML. Oh, it says that this is actually a duplication of the other, so like we can probably ignore this in the future because it's just a duplicate of the other content that we already saw. Or maybe we haven't seen it and then we're like, okay, so we're gonna crawl that one now um, because this seems to be the more important one. Cool. So you can set the canonical URL um, and I highly uh, recommend, uh, recommend to do it. What you shouldn't be doing is you shouldn't be doing it wrong. If you basically all your pages say the canonical is the home page, then uh, right? That's because what you're saying is all the other pages are just duplications of the home page. So we're like, okay, we're gonna ignore them. It's not good. Uh, unless the home page is the only thing that you want. You can also add a robots.txt on your server, on the root folder in your server, uh, to tell us to not crawl something. Notice that I say not crawl something, right? That means literally just if we see this URL in the crawl queue, we're gonna put it in the crawler. The crawler goes like robots.txt says no, out we go. It doesn't say do not index this. Hmm, what's the difference? How does that work? If you can't crawl it, how can you index it? Well, just imagine that I have a very sensitive picture of myself from high school. It's like martinsplit.com slash private slash high school dot JPEG. Um, very, not, not a very friendly picture. Not taken in a good mood. Um, there's like a picture of me as a, as a small child where I'm like super angry and it's like the best picture ever because God, I was fat. Um, I was like, mm. so, fantastic. Um, anyway. Uh, where was I? Oh, right, yeah, so I have my high school picture somewhere and I say in my robots.txt, do not crawl this high school picture, do not crawl anything that is under private. We won't crawl it, but now if you have a website somewhere and you link to it and say like, look at Martin Splitt's ridiculous high school picture, and we crawl that website, we'll be like, ooh, there's a link to Martin Splitt's ridiculous high school picture, that's fantastic. So we're gonna put that in the crawl queue the crawler goes like, oh, I can't crawl this. But we know that this exists and we don't know much about it. We don't really have many signals to rank it. 
But if it's the only Martin Splitz ridiculous high school picture result, we think that knowing that there is a link to it, even if we don't know if the content behind that link is good, it's probably better than not showing anything. So they might show up in search results. It is unlikely, but it does happen. Now the tricky thing here is if you are, if you want us to not index it, you can use the meta no index, right? You have meta robots no index in HTML. There's also an HTTP header um, that you can use for blah, sorry. There's also an HTTP header that you can use to, uh, to say no index. But remember, this is an HTTP header or an HTML meta tag. If you tell us to not crawl, we won't see that because we'll never make an HTTP request. We go to the robots.txt, like, okay, no HTTP request for you, and then we don't see the no index. So you wanna make sure, if you want something definitely not indexed, do not block it in robots.txt. In robots.txt, you can block things where you're like, I don't care if this goes in the, into the index, but I don't want it to be crawled. If it's like images that are pointless, or if it's JavaScript that you use to like, I don't know, do user surveys or something like that, you can block them in robots.txt to tell us not to spend crawl budget on that one, like do not make requests to this, but you don't care if it would hypothetically be indexed. Now JavaScript files and CSS files and stuff like that do not get indexed, so don't worry about that. You wanna be very, very careful with robots.txt when it comes to APIs as well. So this is a website that shows you images of kittens. But unfortunately, there are no kittens down here. This is a screenshot of what Googlebot sees. We see like, ooh, look at that, kittens club, but no kittens. What happened here? Well, someone was smart and thought like, ooh, we can, like Googlebot does not have to make any API calls, except the JavaScript in the front end does need to make API calls. And so when I make the API call here for API slash cats, I get like a, nope, you said we should not do that. We are not allowed to do this, uh, so we didn't. So do not overuse robots.txt. It's a very powerful tool, but it is a fantastic foot gun. Also, if you want to make your websites pop a little more, as marketing people like to say, it has to pop more. Um, if you want it to stand out a little more, as normal people say it, in search results, you can use something called structured data to get Rich results. Rich results are these results where you get like a nice little picture and maybe some ratings and maybe some additional information, depending on what it is. If it's a product in your store, we might show a store availability and prices and ratings and stuff like that. If it's a recipe, we might show calories and, and um, steps you, or the time it takes to prepare it or something like that. So it really depends. We have different forms uh, for rich results. Rich results might also show up in completely different surfaces as we call them. So for instance, these might actually be used for things like Google Home or Google Assistant as well. It works like this. Uh, you include a blob of JSON. Uh, in this case, it's called JSONLD for linked data into your page. In this case, this is an event. Uh, so you say like the type is event. Um, it's uh, some sort of concert series, apparently a jazz concert that happened uh, on the or will happen on the 1st of uh, January 2025. Will eventually end. It has a location. So you're like, you know, you add all this information and we can then pick it up. And as we pick it up, we can then hopefully show you a nice event like this. Uh, sorry, a, a nice um, uh, search result like this. Cool. So how does that work? Well, you know, we have documentation for this. If you search for uh, Google search rich results, uh, you'll find the documentation for all of these different features that we support. It's like articles, books, movie sh uh, movies, TV shows, uh, events, recipes, products, reviews, jobs, I don't know, it's like so many different things are supported. Um, and it depends a bit on the countries that you are active in. I'm not sure if we support all of these in Canada, but like a bunch of it is globally supported. And then you can just plug your URL or even actually you can also uh, copy and paste your source code into this wonderful tool called the rich results test. The rich results test will tell you if you are generally applicable, uh, if, your, if your markup is valid and if it's generally applicable for uh, rich results. It might show you a preview of what a search result will look like, but none of this guarantees that you're gonna show up like this, right? Um, we might still think differently about it. Cool, um, yeah, so we have an overview of all the features that are available uh, that you can browse and see if there's anything for your specific website that might be helpful. And you can generate that as part of your template. Like you don't have to be fancy about it. You can just do it dynamically as well. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about performance because that was also part of SEO. 
So one of the many signals that we, that's the, the amount of ranking that I'm gonna talk about probably. Um, one of the many signals that we look into is how fast does your website load. So if I'm looking at doggos, or I want to look at doggos, and this is the experience I get, I might not be exactly excited because it takes a while to get there. And especially if I'm on like a, a metro or something and then I go into a tunnel and it's like, ah, terrible. Because I need to look at doggos in the morning. It's the only thing that keeps me awake. And now we look at the timeline view and it doesn't look exactly great, does it? It takes quite a while until the first dog shows up. And then I'm often, often being asked like, Martin, you say performance is important, but what metric is Google search looking at? And the answer is, it's complicated. Um, we're looking at multiple metrics and basically try to figure out one value that we can roughly use as an index value for this. And then I get asked like, cool, that was not very helpful. That was a typical engineer answer. It was very accurate, but absolutely useless. Um, so what do I do about this? And I'm like, okay, look, here's the thing. Th we try to find the right result or the best result for the users. So if you make it better for users, you make it better for Google search as well, or you will definitely be highlighted in a different way. So in this case, my website is apparently about showing images of doggos. So the best metric to think about is the time to first doggo, <laughs> obviously. And in this case, it's not fantastically great, is it? Like this takes quite a while until I see the first doggo. So what can I do about this? Well, one way of doing it is not using client-side rendering to make this happen. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's what Jurassic Park taught us, right? Um, so using server-side rendering or pre-rendering, depending on what kind of site you're building, is definitely a way out of this misery. And it, it's like relatively simple, like relatively simple with Angular. You have Angular Universal. Uh, yes, it is a bit of, of setup that is required. And I have been told that apparently they are revamping it, so I would definitely follow very closely what happens on GitHub and in the documentation probably, because maybe they're changing it. I don't know. But um, definitely take a look at universal uh, rendering for, for Angular, which means that you get basically server-side rendering plus client-side hydration, uh, which is quite powerful. How powerful, you ask? That's a very good question. Quite powerful. So each of these is a two-second step. So you can see we're easily four seconds quicker to the time to first doggo. Much, much better. And I haven't actually touched my code. As in like I haven't really done much in my application code. That depends a bit on what your application does and it might be more complicated than this, but generally speaking, I have just made the, the steps as laid out in the uh, documentation and I did that within like, I don't know, 10 minutes or something and then it ran. Now this is an arguably simply a simple application and I'm pretty sure that the real world consequences of this change might be more complicated depending also on your server side infrastructure that you already have. But then definitely consider it an investment that will be good for your users and for your SEO. If you can't make that investment though and you can only make smaller changes to the backend side of things or the server rendering infrastructure, sorry, server serving infrastructure, then we have a workaround in place. It's called dynamic rendering. The way that it works is fundamentally, if a browser asks your server for your application, you just give them what you already give them. That's no change there. However, you do look at the user agent strings. And if you see a user agent that is a crawler, and that can also be serve, uh, uh, like crawlers that do not um, support JavaScript at all, right? Um, like, I don't know, Slack or Facebook or I don't know what. But it can also be Googlebot. And what you do instead is you send your HTML not back to the client, you send it down to what we call a renderer, and then the renderer creates static HTML and sends back the static HTML to this particular client. That's a very, very simple switch in your server configuration. So basically just like you have a condition on the user agent, and depending on the user agent, you either render your normal application or you uh, pass it down to a renderer. You don't have to necessarily operate that renderer yourself, that can be an external service. It's just like an external service means external liability. That's always a tricky one, isn't it? Um, I would not make this investment if you can choose between dynamic rendering and server-side rendering or pre-rendering. I would not use dynamic rendering. It's a workaround, right? And um, if you really have to do it, there's a few tools. Um, there's Rendertron, which is a ready-made pre-renderer, basically, um, that we, uh, we maintain. There's Puppeteer, which allows you to build your own renderer based around uh, the protocol that we uh, have implemented in Chrome and Firefox. 
um, or you use an external service like prerender.io. There's also a code lab if you want to play around with this idea, but again, if you can invest in server-side rendering, do invest in server-side rendering instead of doing this code lab and building a workaround. Cool. Um, if you want to learn a little more about the JavaScript specific bits and pieces, there is also a video series with currently eight episodes. We are filming more episodes later this year um, that explains a bunch of concepts for the different frameworks and also explains the basics in the more detail and gives, a, gives you a bunch of overview of what you need to have a look at, probably. And sometimes you make small mistakes. So I learned this is me, and I fly onto my face. Um, <laughs> sometimes you, you basically, on the greater scheme of things, get everything right, but I make a tiny mistake here. I hold my arms the wrong way, and then I land quicker than I expected to. And sometimes, SEO and sometimes web development is like that. We make a small mistake and we shoot ourselves in the foot or we land on our faces. Now, what are things that I see quite often? Well, first things first, I see soft errors are being a big problem for single page applications and I understand why. So you go to a URL that doesn't exist, um, your Angular application kicks in, the error handler in the routing kicks in and it shows you Whoopsie daisy, there was an error. In this case, it says Kitty has left the building. Great. But if we look at the browser dev tools, our server is not saying that this is a problem. It says this is all good. And then the JavaScript says it's a problem. That's not great for crawlers because we, are, we now have the responsibility to figure out if this is an actual page or if this is an actual error. Is this just a really bad content page or is this a problem? Nothing in the screenshot says a problem except for maybe whoops, right? But Kitty has left the building. Is that an error? Is that not an error? I don't know. Sometimes that goes wrong in search results. Sometimes you show search results like that because of it. That's not great, is it? So. I mean, I'm not swearing on stage. That's fantastic, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> this is what we call a soft error. And the problem here is that the server is configured to always respond with 200 for every URL. And then your specific routing figures out what's happening and, and serves error content. But then this, the response has already been done. And the response is already positive. So can we get back to using HTTP statuses somehow? Yes. One way of doing it is, in this case, we are making an API call, uh, and our API call goes somewhere and then goes like, does this cat exist? No, if it doesn't exist, we basically just make a redirection to a URL that we have configured to always return 404. Now you can say like, well, if I know that this URL doesn't exist, then I can already configure it on the server side to be 404, yes. But in this case, I have a database of a thousand kitties, and some of them might sometimes disappear from the database because they go upstate. Um, then how do I deal with that? Well, it's, it's a little tricky to update your server every time someone deletes something in the database. It's a little easier to just make a redirect to one URL where you know that it's gonna return a 404. What's gonna happen in our case is we're gonna render it, we're gonna get redirected, we're gonna be like, ah, so this page is no longer there, it's like a redirection now to this other page, and that page is a 404, so we don't need to like deal with this. Okay, fantastic, that's good, that's done. It's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is if you have a robots meta tag somewhere on your page that says all good, index this, you can change its content to no index dynamically. You can go like, okay, so yes, uh, now that I see that this cat does not exist, please don't index this. And we're like, okay, cool, this page does not want to be indexed, all good, not a problem. And we're not going to index it. Simple as that. Now you might think, hold on, can't I just turn it around? That's something that I actually have done before I joined Google myself, and I was very surprised by the uh, outcome. Let's say I have a meta tag somewhere on my page that always says, like, it's in my HTML. My initial HTML has a title, has a meta description, and a meta tag, robots, no index. And then when I know that this content actually exists, only then I switch it to index. Does that solve the problem? Is that good? Is that a good way of doing it? I'll give you a hint. So, okay. <laughs> now you might wonder like, why the hell is this guy having GIFs of himself? That's because of, for legal reasons, I can't use GIFs on, from the internet anymore. So I'm using this one now. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't work 
Because if you look at the pipeline, what happens here is we are making a crawl, we get the HTML, and then we look at the HTML. And when we look at the HTML and your HTML has a no index, then we're like, oh, very nice. We cannot do some work. Lovely. You don't want to be in the index? Cool. The problem is that JavaScript is executed down here. So if you have the no index in the HTML, we'll be like, done, and never run your JavaScript. So all your pages are now in hell. <laughs> it's not good. That's not what you wanted. Also not a good idea. On your home page, you have a pop-up for, I don't know, GDPR or something. And um, the user clicks on, yes, I agree. Yes, yes, steal all my data. It's fine. Uh, and then you set a cookie. And then on every other page, because you don't want to have this pop-up code on every other page, on every other page, you're just checking if the cookie is set. And if the cookie isn't set, you just redirect us back to the home page, the first page where you have that pop-up. Well, the problem there is that Googlebot actually gets stuck in this because we don't actually persist any data except for caching. So we do not use local storage. We do not use session storage, IndexedDB, WebSQL, or cookies for that matter. So do not rely on cookies to necessarily be present on all pages that you want Googlebot to visit. Googlebot is basically like a fresh user who has never been to your website for each of the pages that you, we, we visit. Also, you want to make sure that you are using feature detection and not just rely on so, uh, the browser features to just casually be there. Uh, to give you an, whoops, uh, sorry. To give you an example, um, here in this case, what I do is I look, does this browser support geolocation? And if so, I get the current position, and once I have the current position, I load the content that is um, local to you. Like if I'm in, in um, Toronto right now, I get the news stories from Toronto. That makes sense. If I'm in a browser that doesn't support it, fine. Then I just get like whatever, the latest or the, the highest ranked or whatever, the most commented, something like that, the most recent news stories from all over the world. It's good. The problem here is you are ignoring one entire case. And this is not even feature detection. This is just error handling, really. Um, the problem here is what if my phone does not have working GPS or if I'm in the tube right now and I actually don't get a proper GPS fix or if I'm Googlebot and just downright decline all these requests. Well, then I don't get anything because I land in this, in, in this particular if case and then there's nothing that loads content. So what you should be doing instead is you should handle the error case as well. Like if, if this feature is uh, supported but there's a problem and just handle that accordingly. It's not very hard, but a bunch of people fall over this. Yay! If you wonder what features we do and do not support and what are potential pitfalls, then we have a page for you. This is the troubleshooter guide. Um, it is relatively new, so if you find something that is not explained there, please just ask us. We have a send feedback button on the page. Uh, you can also just ping us on Twitter, and we'll happily see if we need to add something to this guide. But we need your help. We need to hear from you what doesn't go so well. Now, how can you test your site? Because obviously, as you develop, we have a bunch of tools um, that help us. And actually, Lighthouse has a bunch of SEO audits. They are very generic, and they don't give you the full picture. They are very, very good first stop. But there's more tools. There's like the mobile-friendly tool, which surprisingly, who would have thought, tells you if your page is mobile friendly. Big surprise. But that's not the only thing it does. It also gives you a screenshot of what Googlebot sees when it renders your page, at least for um, uh, above the fold content. So like you get some content in the screenshot. If this would be blank, then you'd be like, oh, this is weird, this shouldn't be blank. If you want to look for something that is below the fold, that is totally possible, or if it's, if it's for like meta tags or something, then you can use the HTML. This is the rendered HTML that comes out of the rendering process. We are not having like a fake renderer. This is the actual renderer. So we are rendering your page real quick as a, like a preview thing. Sometimes caching is an issue, and then uh, like we are not using caching, so sometimes we, we time out with things. But generally speaking, you get the rendered HTML as we would see it, and you can search in it so you can find if every, content, uh, every piece of content that you care for is actually in the rendered HTML. Uh, more importantly, it also gives you an error console for JavaScript. So all the console log, all the console, the console info, warning, errors, all that kind of stuff ends up here. You even get a stack trace and the location in the JavaScript where it failed. It also shows you if you have like some page, uh, some, some resources, some URLs that are roboted and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of useful as well. Um, if you want a more monitoring kind of thing, so this is good for debugging, but now this tool here, the Search Console, 
is not necessarily as much for debugging as it is for monitoring your site. This does not take a single URL. This basically makes you verify that you own an entire website, an entire domain, for instance, and it allows you to see what are the pages that are in the index, what, is, what has been crawled, what has been indexed, what hasn't been indexed, where have I seen errors, or where has Googlebot seen errors? So you can basically get a site-wide overview of that right here. Uh, if you then see like a URL that should be indexed and isn't, <coughs> you can dive into why. In this case, the URL that we found is apparently a 404 page. Hmm. Maybe that's not what I wanted. Maybe I need to check my server configuration. Uh, it also gives you like uh, a, a bunch of URLs that are affected by this problem. And if you fixed it or if you think you fixed it, you can press the little validate fix button. There's like a, so right now it's, it's gray because I haven't done anything yet. But basically you can press that lo lovely validate fix button. We're gonna recrawl your page, re-render it, and then we see if it's actually fixed or not. And then we let you know. Uh, it also gives you basically analytics before analytics, as I like to call it. So analytics tell you what happens when people are on your website. The performance report tells you what happens before people come to your website, at least within Google search. So whenever someone types in a query and your website shows up, you'll see an impression here. When the person who has queried and seen your page clicks on it, you'll see a click here. So you know what kind of web uh, search queries are being routed to you, how you're doing for these search queries. Is that a search query that you should probably do more for? Is there a search query where you don't have good content or is there content that is just not standing out enough for, for people to click on it? So you can do like a bunch of optimization here as well. And you can actually run tests. So I can use any of the URLs that are part of, of my domain and run a test. And in this case, for instance, it says like it's not on Google. And I'm like, why? And down here it says coverage, crawled, currently not indexed. So it has crawled it and then decided that it's not good enough. And I'm like, oh, okay, fair enough. And then I can investigate this and debug this properly. So that's quite a cool tool. Um, actually, that's not true. This, ignore that. Tools are updated. They're using the latest version of uh, Googlebot. It's all good. I should really not change my slides minutes before I go on stage. Um, as I promised you, there's plenty more that you can dive into and learn about SEO as a developer. Uh, we have the JavaScript SEO videos. We have guides for you. We have, have a developer's guide for, for search uh, as well. Uh, we have the troubleshooter. We have code labs. We have a YouTube channel with more and more content coming in. We also, the YouTube channel also has every now and then we have uh, office hours, online office hours, where you can ask us questions and we answer them. Um, and then it's recorded, so even if time zones are an issue, you can see the responses later on. And we have a blog where we keep you updated on the latest and greatest of what we're doing. Uh, we also have a Twitter, but that, you know, you figure it out. Um, yeah, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I know it's late, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin.